Greetings, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and I welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I uh, welcome all of you who are joining us online, on television, on radio, all the different ways that we connect uh, these days. And uh, what a week it's been in South Louisiana. Uh, my wife has a colleague who is currently sleeping in a tent in his backyard. And so even if you're joining us from a tent, welcome. Welcome. Uh, and I do invite you in this time of worship to sort of settle yourself in. We're going to talk about the importance of rest a little bit and how Jesus needed that in, in, in his life. So settle yourself here. Uh, let your heart and your mind catch up to your bodies. And it is my prayer that you would encounter God's presence in this time of worship, that you would hear a word from God for your life, and that you would leave renewed uh, in your commitment to Christ and to his call to love your neighbor as yourself. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Mark. From there he set out and went away for the region of Tyre. He entered, a he entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to throw the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs that eat the table, even the dogs under the table eat the children's scraps. Then she said, then he said to her, For saying that, you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre, and by way of Sidon, towards the Sea of Galilee, in the region of the Decapolis. They brought him to a deaf man who had been an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then immediately, then immediately looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spake plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they came. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this reading from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Mark highlights two healing stories from Jesus' ministry, one of a demon-possessed girl and the other of a man who was deaf and who had a, a speaking impediment. And for many people, it's the location of these healings that is the point. And so one of them takes place in the area of Tyre, which was about 35 miles north of Galilee in Phoenicia. So it's in a, this is in a foreign country outside the traditional area of Israel. Um, and so Jesus goes there, he heals this woman. The other one takes place in the Decapolis, which is to the east of the Sea of Galilee. And the Decapolis, is no, what, it's, what it's most well known for is it was the place where retired Roman soldiers received their pensions. And so the, uh, Rome would give them a little piece of land. They wanted them far away from Rome. And so they put them in this area of the Decapolis. So these were areas that were heavily populated by non-Jewish people or Gentiles. And so the point of the stories, many people say, is that Jesus' ministry was not just to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles, that the gospel was not just intended for Israel, but for the world. The end, I should sit down and that's it. Um, you're not going to get that lucky. No. <laughs> But anyway, so, uh, but I, I think there's a whole lot more going on in these stories, and there's a whole, uh, there's much, much deeper things going on in here than this. And I think that what these stories reveal is they reveal something to us about Jesus, uh, that if we will listen, uh, will offer us encouragement and direction, uh, especially for those who find themselves exhausted from the many trials and challenges of life. Can anybody relate? Exhausted. 
from the trials and challenges of life. So again, Mark tells us that Jesus travels north to the region of Tyre. It's about a day's walk, about 11 hours, if you consider that a day, an 11-hour walk from Galilee to the region of Tyre. And when Jesus arrives there, this is one of the key things, he entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. So to me, there goes this whole idea that these stories are about ministering to the Gentiles. Because if Jesus was going to minister to the Gentiles, why, when he got there, did he hide out? Right? I mean, that kind of defeats the point, right? So he, he gets to this area, and he goes into a house, and he doesn't want anyone to know he's there. What's going on? What's going on? So if you look back in Mark, and I always encourage you to do this. Whenever you're reading a scripture, look around the story and see what's happening around it. But if you look through there, you'll see that Jesus has been through a lot. First of all, he has been rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. So when you all go back to your hometown, uh, what, do you, what do you do when you go there? Right? You want to go visit your friends. Maybe you drive your, your family by your old house or your old high school, or you go eat at a favorite restaurant, right? I mean, that's what home is about. And, and what Jesus does is he goes to his hometown and he's rejected by the people. That had to hurt. And then shortly after that, he discovers that John the Baptist, who is his cousin and who he shares a lot with in ministry, has been executed. And these things are hitting Jesus hard. And if you look in this, in this section of Mark, in Mark about 5, 6, and then 7, you'll see that what Jesus says to the disciples after these things is, come on, let's go away to a deserted place. Let's go somewhere quiet. Uh, and so they make their way off to a quiet place, but the crowds follow Jesus. And so this huge crowd follows Jesus. And this is where he feeds the 5,000, okay? And he just can't seem to get a break And so finally, I think what he decides he needs to do is, if I'm going to get a moment of peace, if I'm going to get a moment, i got to kind of like get out of Dodge. And so again, he he heads 35 miles north to this region of Tyre. When he gets there, he checks into the hotel. He tells the bellhop, look, hold all my calls and leave me alone. Finally, a little peace and quiet, right? Can you all relate to that? So, uh, but Mark tells us that Jesus could not escape notice. And so his fame has already started to spread, even even outside of Israel. And a woman finds him, and she begs him to heal her daughter. Now, what happens next is a little disturbing. This is what Jesus says to her. Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and to throw it to the dogs. Now, if you understand what's going on here, you've got a Jewish man and a Gentile or non-Jewish woman. When Jesus is talking about the children, it's very clear that what he's talking about are the people of Israel. They are the children of God, the people of God. Uh, And when he's talking about dogs, uh, it was a common slur for Jewish people to call Gentile people dogs. Uh, And in the Middle East to this day, to call somebody a dog is not a nice thing to call them. Uh, And so, What Jesus is saying to this woman is, look, I came for Israel, not for you. Or I came for Israel, wait your turn. This is not usually what we expect to hear from Jesus, right? So we have to ask the question, you've got to stop, what's going on here? So there are all kinds of explanations about to try to figure out why, why is Jesus saying this to this woman. Some say that he was testing her faith that it was sort of like he's pushing her away a little bit to see if she really meant it and, and, and to come back again. Some say that she was a wealthy woman, and Tyre was a very wealthy city, and that maybe she needed to be humbled a little bit, and so Jesus was humbling her. Some say that Jesus himself was still growing in his understanding of his ministry to the Gentiles, right? So he didn't quite have a full picture of it, and this, this woman helps him to kind of get there. Others say that Jesus was simply displaying a bias that Jewish men would have had towards Gentile women. What do you all think? I don't find any of those satisfying answers. So I want to offer another possibility. So again, Jesus is trying to get away. He's been trying to get away for some time. He finally gets out of town, gets away from the many demands that have been put upon him. He finally has a place he can kick up his feet. Now look, you all know these moments, right? So you finally got the kids off to bed, like you finally put them to bed, and you've gotten into your comfortable chair, and you've put on your favorite TV show. Or how about this, how about after a long week, a stressful week, you get in your favorite lazy boy and you turn on the LSU game hoping for a little good news, they're going to come back, 
right? Uh, and, it's a, and it's a three-day weekend, right? So it's like, it's just, it's just one of those moments. You're just relaxed. You got your snacks. You got your drink. You're, you're just, you're chilling. Or how about this? How about after a, a week with no electricity in just exhausting heat, you hear that first click and the air comes back on and the fan starts spinning and your whole body just relaxes, right, as the air conditioning kind of starts to flow back into your house. Do you know the moments? You know those moments. I just need a moment of peace. And the last thing you want in those moments is what? An interruption. And I think that Jesus found himself in that place. I think he was just plain worn out, and I think he was responding to the woman from that exhaustion. So here's a question. Was physical and emotional exhaustion a part of what Jesus experienced when he took on flesh? Right? He took on flesh. He experienced the things that we experience. Now, I do want to say this. Tradition teaches that Jesus was without sin, and I believe that. I believe Jesus had to be without sin because of who he was. So I'm not saying Jesus sinned here, but did he just have a moment? Can we allow Jesus to be that human, can we? So I don't know about you, but I have found myself battling a little bit with compassion fatigue recently. It just seems like the demands are never ending. It's been one crisis after another crisis after another crisis. Maybe a better way to talk about it is crisis fatigue. I just, I don't know sometimes, right? Uh, All of our lives have been turned upside down for over a year now. We were reminiscing about this as a family the other day, and Zoe, who's a senior in high school now, pointed out to me that the last normal year of school she had was her freshman year. COVID, right? And now we're in senior year. We're still dealing with COVID, but now we've got a hurricane that's, I mean, we've been through so much. And there are times I wonder, do you wonder how much more can we take? And I got to tell you, there are times where I want to go away someplace and not let anybody know that I'm there. And so I'll tell you this, it gives me great comfort to think about the fact that Jesus might have felt this way too, that Jesus understands. Uh, How does that song go? You know that one, what a friend we have in Jesus? What's the line? Are you weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Jesus knows our every, what? Weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. So one thing I want to say this morning is if you're exhausted, and we don't show this to a lot of people, especially like I think us here in this church, like we're the kind of like we got our stuff together people, right? Uh, you don't, we don't show our weaknesses very often, but here's what I want you to know. If you're exhausted, if you're just exhausted, Jesus understands. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, so thankfully this story doesn't end there. Uh, This Syrophoenician woman doesn't give up. She presses Jesus. She uses a little wit and a little humor, and what she says to Jesus is this, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She she stays there with Jesus. Um, And in that moment, something changes. Jesus says to her, because of that word, uh, your daughter has been healed. And, he, and she goes back home and she finds indeed that the demon has lost her daughter. Uh, so we have a happy ending to this short and maybe a little tense encounter. But again, I, I just want to give you, what do you think is going on here? What do you think is going on here? For me, I think what we're seeing is this kind of exhausted Jesus who's hit a wall. And fortunately, he encounters this woman who doesn't take no for an answer, and because of her, she kind of pushes him back into the direction that I think that God wanted him to go in. And so he comes back down to the capitalist, and he heals this other guy, and he enters back into ministry. But this is a really interesting thing, that this Gentile woman, and this is a theme that you see over and over again in the Scriptures, God uses people that we don't expect God to use. So he uses this Gentile woman, this non-Jewish foreign woman, to kind of get to Jesus' head and get to Jesus' heart and get him going again. So here's what I took away from this reading. We will get tired. We need to learn to rest. But we also do not need to quit. Uh, So you're going to get tired. Uh, How many of you practice Sabbath? How many of you have a built-in day of rest? Uh, this, is a, this is a biblical command, by the way. It's, 
one of the Ten Commandments, a day where you do no work. And I'm not talking about the day where you catch up on all the other work that you didn't do the rest of the week. I'm talking about a day to give thanks to God and to enjoy the blessings of your life. How many of you take a day and do that every week? You know that's a biblical command, right? I, I think it's fascinating. I think that we think, well, we're too sophisticated for that. We're crazy, right? Uh, if you can't take a full day, how about a half a day where you just say, Noth- nothing, I'm just going to do n- nothing, but give thanks to God and enjoy the blessings of my life. Don't you need that? Don't, God knows you need that. Do you Sabbath? <laughs> Let me ask you some things. Are you staying hydrated? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you watching your alcohol intake? Are you going for walks or doing something to get your, you know, your body chemistry going the right way? What are the things that are a part of your life, regular part of life, that help you rest and recuperate and recharge in healthy ways, right? What are they? We need to learn to rest. But at the same time, we must not quit. So the, uh, the needs in the world around us are so great. You all know that. I don't need to tell you that. Uh, when the winds settled and we started getting communications after Ida, I reached out to a friend of mine, Reverend Sean Anglem, who's in New Orleans, because I knew New Orleans had gotten hit pretty bad, and I texted him. I said, Sean, how's everything going? Do you need anything? And uh, Sean sent me back, and he said, we have a ministry at the church called Hagar's House, and Hagar's House is a shelter for women and for children. And he said, they're without air conditioning, they're getting pretty miserable and cranky, and they could use some things. And I said, look, send me a list. So he sent me a list, and we sent it out on, uh, we sent out an email, and we put it out on social media. And one thing I want to encourage you all to do in the coming weeks is pay attention to your emails from the church and social media, because we're going to be communicating a lot of ways that you can be a part of meeting different needs. But anyway, so we put the list out on social media, and our church, you all, provided books, games, kiddie pools, batteries, gift cards to Winn-Dixie, and I think most importantly, two generators and some gas that uh, George Ragsdale and Taylor Bacon drove down to New Orleans on Friday. And uh, Reverend Sean Anglem, again, who's the pastor there, uh, told me this. He said, Saturday morning, so after the generators had been delivered, I walked into Hagar's house. It was comfortable. It was calm. Mothers were smiling. Children were playing in the children's playroom, all because our brothers and sisters at First Methodist Baton Rouge believed and acted, and we are so grateful. So uh, one of the families that collected some of the supplies and brought them to the church was the Murray family, and Camille Murray, who was seven, uh, we asked, why, why, why are you doing this? Why is this important? And she said, it's important to help others because that's what God teaches us to do. So here's the thing. The needs around us are great right now. It's incredible the need that is out there. There are a lot of hurting people. And here's what you need to know. Uh, You can make a difference. You can be the one to bring a little light and a little love into these people's lives. You are needed right now. And so what I want to say is, I know you're tired. We're all tired. We need to learn to rest, right? You with me? Rest. Take the rest you need. Jesus needed rest. But don't ever quit because God has work for us to do. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.